Hello, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be back with uh, my people from Health Data Research Network Canada and also to connect with some new folks, including uh, more members of the public and, and people with an interest in this topic. I'm just going to start with a few minutes of the story of how this project came to be. And a part of that, you've already heard from Kim McGrail when she spoke earlier today about the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy and her role on the Expert Advisory Working Group. So where I'll come in is to say that I think because of the Expert Advisory uh, Group and Kim's contributions to it, and also because of the leadership of Vivek Goyle and Eric Sutherland from the start, uh, right from the point that people were scoping out the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy, there was a strong commitment to aligning it with the needs and interest of the people that contribute the data. In other words, all of us and all the members of all the different publics in society. And as part of that commitment, the Public Health Agency of Canada came to Health Data Research Network Canada and said, can you provide us with some information that would complement what's already described in the literature? And just to very briefly describe that for folks who may not be aware, there are many Canadian and international studies that have a very similar conclusion. They've all found that members of the public support health data being used for public benefit, but it's not blanket approval. There are conditions attached to it, and different people have different ideas about what those conditions should be. So there's this old adage in research that what you find out really depends a lot on how you ask the question. And we didn't think it was worth asking the same question that had already been described in the research literature again. So instead, what we did, our, our team of researchers from Health Data Research Network Canada, whom you're going to hear from, is we thought, well, instead of asking people what they think about various scenarios, let's bring together a group of participants who are as different from each other as they can be out of the people that have applied. And let's see if there's anything that they actually agree on under two broad categories. The first is, are there any users and uses of data that they agree on? And the second point was, are there any conditions or requirements that they agree have to be in place for data use to be supported? So what you're going to hear from shortly from my colleagues is some of the highlights of what we did and what we found. And then there'll definitely be time at the end for Q&A so you can learn more about the points that are of the most interest. And I'll, I'll highlight as well that I see several of our participants and peer reviewers are, are at this forum today and just give them the heads up that they may actually be the best ones to answer some of the questions. So we don't want to put anybody on the spot, but that may naturally emerge. But just before I do that, I want to pique your interest, uh, hopefully, and give you a bit of a teaser and let you know that out of those two categories of things that we asked about, you know, on the one hand, users and uses of health data, and the other hand, uh, conditions and requirements, we actually did find consensus on quite a few things in one of them, and no consensus at all in the other. So that was interesting for us. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Julia, who I think is going to start off the presentation. Merci beaucoup, Alison. En fait, c'est Roxane qui va commencer, mais il n'y a pas de problème. Julia va être juste après moi. Um, donc, c'est ça. En fait, euh, première. Comme le si bien introduit Alison, donc les, les résultats qu'on va vous présenter aujourd'hui, ainsi que la démarche, en fait, euh, c'est vraiment euh, un survol. Donc, euh, si jamais vous êtes intéressé à aller consulter le rapport, euh, le rapport complet et puis les annexes détaillées, on vous invite à aller visiter le site web du réseau de recherche sur les données de santé du Canada. Donc, euh, voilà. Euh, donc, les, les, on va commencer en fait euh, par remercier les gens qui ont participé à ce super beau projet, ce super beau rapport. En fait, euh, c'est euh, les résultats qu'on vous présente aujourd'hui et puis euh, tout ce qui se trouve dans le rapport, en fait, représente les points de vue de conseillers expérimentés du public et des patients. Donc, au total, on a 20 personnes qui ont participé avec nous à ce super beau projet, donc 10 participants francophones et 10 participants anglophones. Donc, quand on utilise le mot participant, ce n'est pas pour désigner des participants à la recherche. Donc, ces personnes-là ont vraiment contribué euh, au contenu et puis à, à l'ensemble du projet. On a également 13 personnes qui ont participé à, à titre de pairs examinateurs, donc qui ont vraiment révisé de manière critique le rapport public. Donc, euh, vous avez au bas de la diapositive euh, l'ensemble des personnes qui ont participé à ce super beau projet, donc on les remercie beaucoup pour leur contribution. Donc, le projet a été financé par l'Agence de la santé publique du Canada dans le cadre du travail consultatif d'experts de la stratégie pancanadienne des données sur la santé. Donc, l'objectif de cette stratégie-là, c'est de relever les défis actuels en matière de collecte, 
de partage et d'utilisation des données de santé au Canada. Donc, euh, ça va de soi là, consulter et euh, comprendre les perspectives du public envers, euh, par rapport à l'utilisation de leurs données de santé. Euh, donc, le projet, euh, Alison l'a mentionné, là, donc le projet a été co-dirigé euh, par des membres du réseau de recherche sur les données de santé du Canada, donc Julia Burt et puis Alison, et euh, en collaboration avec nous à l'Université de Sherbrooke euh, dans le cadre du groupe de recherche interdisciplinaire en informatique de la santé, donc moi-même et euh, Annabelle Cummins qui est en ligne en ce moment. Euh, on a également reçu l'appui et les conseils du euh, groupe de travail sur l'engagement du public du euh, RDS Canada. Donc, euh, je, je vais passer quand même rapidement sur cette diapositive-là parce qu'Alison a fait une très, très belle introduction. Là. Mais en gros, euh, ce que les écrits montrent, ce qu'on sait déjà, c'est que, euh, en fait, c'est que le, les, le public considère les données de santé vraiment comme un atout euh, qui devrait être utilisé en, dans l'intérêt du public. Mais bien sûr, c'est un soutien qui est conditionnel. Donc, on a différentes conditions et euh, risques qui doivent être pris en considération dans euh, dans ce contexte-là, donc bien sûr, pour en soulever que quelques exemples, donc on, on parle de la vie privée, euh, de la sécurité, aussi c'est quoi les motivations commerciales, bien sûr, on veut éviter tout ce qui est euh, vente de données de santé, et aussi au niveau de l'équité et la justice, c'est qu'on veut s'assurer que l'utilisation des données de santé va être, euh, en fait, éviter la discrimination des groupes qui sont systématiquement marginalisés. Donc, au bas de la diapositive, là, si jamais il y a des gens qui sont intéressés à en apprendre davantage sur euh, toutes les, les études et les rapports existants sur le sujet, là, on a mis quelques références, donc euh, vous pourrez consulter. Thank you, Roxanne. Um, so I think before we get into the details of, of the, the process and what we heard, it's important to understand these two terms. I think many of you probably already know them and they have been mentioned here in earlier sessions, but it's these, this idea of social license and health data social license because they are really kind of center of, of this work. Um, but social license, as you can see here, is an informal permission granted by stakeholders to organizations which are performing work that affects those stakeholders in some way. What I found interesting is that this term was originally used in the mining industry. So when mining companies would go into communities to do what they do, they would really need to have the members of the communities, um, the public support so that, that the public members needed to actually support what these mining companies were doing. Um, and this goes beyond laws and regulations. So it is possible for an activity to be legally allowed, but outside of social license. Um, Increasingly, the term is being used to describe which data-related activities have the support of members of the public and under what conditions. So when we say that a, a use or a user of health data is within social license, what we mean is that it's a use or user that at a minimum is publicly acceptable, and ideally it has active public support. And you'll be hearing us use this term or this phrase within social license, not within social license throughout uh, this session. So as Allison mentioned, we wanted to really hear experienced public and patient advisors uh, views and perspectives on two main things. One being essential requirements for health data social license that should be in place. Um, so an example of an essential requirement that somebody might think would be that health data are not sold. Uh, another example could be that plain language is used uh, by entities who are collecting health data. And the second thing we wanted to find out more about was specific examples of health data uses and users that our participants in, in this process felt were within and not within social license. Um, and kind of as an overarching principle, we wanted to capture a diversity of views and we attempted, and I hope we achieved that through inclusive design. Uh, and we'll explain more about that in a little bit. So as kind of a bird's eye or high level view of our overall approach, um, our methods and a process really focused on inclusive public engagement. So. Uh, we capture participants' views through written submissions, as well as two facilitated dialogue sessions, so two in English and two in French. Um, the results and the perspectives from these folks were then converted into a report that was reviewed by the experienced public and patient advisors, both the participants who were involved in the actual process and another group of peer, peer reviewers. Um, this report was then shared with the Public Health Agency of Canada and then more widely in English and French. 
Um, following that, kind of the third step is we asked participants and peer reviewers how they felt about the process, what worked, what didn't work. And we used the patient and public engagement evaluation tool. Um, this tool was developed by Canadian researchers uh, and practitioners in patient and public engagement coming out of McMaster University, uh, led by Julia Abelson. Um, so it's a tool really designed to evaluate public and patient engagement initiatives. So we'll share a little bit about those results as well. So there are really two main aspects to this process. Uh, the first, as I mentioned, is this inclusive design approach. And we did this so we could identify diversity of views and particularly views that maybe weren't as present or weren't as prominent in previous work uh, in this area. Um, and the second was this approach that is called the five finger facilitation method. And we use this facilitation approach to help participants come to consensus on examples of uses and users that they felt were within and not within social license. So I'll explain a bit more about these two um, approaches now. Um, inclusive design. So we know that people who hold minority views are the ones who are least likely to be served by the status quo, but they're often holders of knowledge that is essential to design policies, processes, products that work for the entire population, not just the majority. So we made sure to include in the report uh, views and requirements that were supported by many participants, but also views and requirements supported by just one or two participants. But I do want to acknowledge that even views and requirements supported by one or two participants, that could mean still thousands of people across Canada share these views. I do also want to acknowledge um, that our inclusive design approach was informed by the work of uh, Yuta Trevorianis, who is at the Inclusive Design Research Institute at OCAD University. They do a lot of really great work in this area. And I like this image on the slide. I think it's a helpful image to just show why it's so important to include minority views when designing processes, processes and policies that work for everyone, not just the majority. So in inclusive design, we say that it's predominantly these edge users, so the little dots on the outer edge of the circle that contribute the most relevant and innovative um, perspectives when we are designing policies and, and procedures. So it's really important to have these people at the table when we're doing these sort of things. As mentioned, the second component or, or the way that we approached this work was through facilitated dialogue. Um, so the participants did participate in two facilitated dialogue sessions, two in English, two in French. And in these sessions, they really had the opportunity to share their views, listen to each other and change their mind. Um, but the facilitators made it very clear that participants did not have to change their mind. Um, so one session focused on the first point, which was around essential requirements for health data social license. And the other focused on um, examples of uses and users that they felt were within or not within health data social license. Um, so to help folks come to consensus, we use this five finger facilitation method. Um, so as an example, the facilitators would read out a statement and this will be a bit of a spoiler because this was a statement that uh, it was a real thing that happened. Um, they would say something like, it is within social license for health data to be used by university based researchers to understand the drivers of disease and well being." Then the participants would raise their hand. They could be zero or a fist for absolute zero support all the way up to, to five that indicated full support. Um, we would then ask participants who were in full support of the statement to explain their reasons. Same for the folks who were in complete opposition. Sometimes this resulted in some wording changes. We would then read the statement again and then the, the people would vote again. Um, and then the, the, the statement was deemed to have consensus if no one had a closed fist. Um, and this approach I, I felt was really neat and it was a good way to get kind of more perspectives because it wasn't an all or none thing. It wasn't a binary, yes, I agree with this or no, I don't. Um, people were allowed to, or we gave people the option to support a statement while also expressing concern about the statement. So the exciting stuff, what did we find? What were the participants' perspectives? I'll pass it back to Roxanne. Donc, après, des, après des, de nombreuses heures de réflexion individuelle, parce que les participants ont eu des, des moments où ils devaient écrire leurs réflexions sur, euh, 
donc euh, sur papier, et euh, aussi avec des discussions de groupe. Là, on n'a pas réussi à dégager vraiment un consensus, un consensus sur les exigences essentielles de l'acceptabilité sociale des données de santé. Donc, au départ, on avait, avec euh, la revue de la littérature et tout ça qu'on avait fait, on avait fourni une liste de 40 exigences aux participants. Puis, euh, plutôt que de réduire cette liste-là, on, est, on, est, on a eu la belle surprise d'avoir plus... Euh, en fait, la liste est allongée à plus de 85 exigences essentielles qu'au moins une personne trouvait qui, qui justement qui était essentielle. Euh, au total, sur ces 85 exigences-là, il y en a 38 qui ont été considérées essentielles que par un ou deux participants. Euh, donc, ça montrait quand même la grande diversité des opinions euh, qui ont été discutées dans le cadre du groupe. Puis, euh, dans le rapport, toutes les 85 exigences ont été, euh, ont été rapportées. Donc, le but, c'était vraiment justement de, de bien refléter, refléter l'approche de conception inclusive. Donc, euh, en gros, là, ici, on vous montre les, les exigences essentielles là, qui, qui, ont, qui, ont, qui ont été considérées comme la majorité des, des points de vue. Donc, les patients, ben, pas les patients, pardon, les participants ont identifié comme étant euh, euh, le plus, euh, en grande majorité, en fait. Là, ça, ça tournait autour de trois grands concepts qui est quand même intéressant parce que ça nous, ça nous ramène un peu au nuage de mots qu'on a vu dans l'activité précédente. Donc, on a des thèmes qui se ressemblent. Ici, on a la transparence et la communication. Donc, euh, l'accès aussi, l'importance d'avoir accès à ses propres données personnelles de santé et puis euh, la confiance envers les organisations qui utilisent et qui détiennent les données de santé et aussi au niveau de leur imputabilité. Donc, dans le, dans le bas de la diapositive, on vous a mis quelques citations des participants dans leurs propres mots qui reflétaient bien ces trois catégories euh, d'exigences-là. Donc, ici, c'est une représentation visuelle, un peu comme, comme je le disais tantôt, le, la, ça ressemble un peu à l'activité précédente. Donc, on a pris les 85 exigences, puis on a fait ressortir de manière, euh, en nuage de mots, là, les, les mots qui ressortaient. Dans, dans, donc, les plus fréquents, c'est les mots qui, qui se retrouvent plus gros dans le, dans le, dans le nuage de mots. Donc, on, on voit des, euh, des mots qui, qui ressemblent à tantôt. Donc, transparence, bénéfice. Euh, on a sécurité, contrôle, on a la confiance. Et euh, le, la diapositive précédente, euh, proche, la prochaine diapositive, en fait, c'est le nuage de mots qui est représenté en français. Donc, j'ai oublié de le mentionner tantôt, mais l'ensemble le, du travail a été fait à la fois en anglais et en français. Donc, ça nous donnait aussi confiance euh, de mener des projets de ce type-là euh, dans les deux langues dans, dans le futur. And I can just add, just because there was some discussion earlier about kind of, I guess, the benefits, but also some of the pitfalls with word clouds and, and using word clouds to, to show themes. In this particular exercise, we did, um, we were able to go back to the participants who said certain things and get clarification on what they meant. And in that way, we could actually code, because we, we, did, we did all the word codes or word clouds manually. So we could go back and code certain terms and put them together so that they would more hopefully accurately represent the different major themes that, that were coming up. So it was, it was an interesting exercise to be able to, to visually represent some of these themes um, that, that you see here. So essential requirements that were perhaps less commonly identified. So minority views. And I do want to say that these aren't necessarily views that other people in the process disagreed with. They just weren't ones that were on the top of people's lists for essential requirements. Um, so the first is around the risks of strict regulations on health data use. So while a lot of the participants talked in length about the importance of privacy and strict safeguards on data, there were other people who felt that these health data controls, safeguards, and regulations need to be proportionate um, and not so burdensome that they prevent benefits from really being able to be obtained from health data. So there's really those two ends of the spectrum there. And I would say most people kind of fall in the middle. The second is this idea of collection of health data from, from vulnerable individuals or populations. So a couple of people felt that when data are collected at the point of healthcare service delivery, so for example, someone in an acute care setting or in a hospital, um, there should be some communications that should address and mitigate the risk that these patients who are often in quite vulnerable um, states feel pressure to provide consent or provide their data for whatever reason. And the third is around the idea of respectful communication um, during health data collection. So some people felt that organizations need to be uh, respectful, polite, and welcoming when communicating with patients and members of the public about collecting their data. Now, I mentioned those requirements where people didn't disagree with them per se, but these here on the, on the, uh, on the slide 
Some people were actively opposed to certain requirements that other people felt were absolutely essential. Um, so the first example we'll give here is around this idea of access. So some people felt that everyone should have access to their personal health data, um, whereas others felt that if we give people this ability, it's ultimately going to jeopardize uh, the privacy of individuals and would increase the risk that someone could access someone's health data that, that shouldn't. Um, Another one that people really did agree on was this idea of anonymizing data. Um, so some people felt that data in all scenarios should be anonymized. So to the extent that we can de-identify data, it should be. While others noted that in some cases, we need to have identifying information uh, within data. Um, the third one, not on the screen here, but this idea of consent. And I think Rachel Plachinsky talked about this, this idea of opting in or opting out to providing your health data. Um, some people emphasize the importance of having up for having consent when sharing health data in any situation, whereas others felt that if there's too much requirement and too much um, protection and requirement to opt in to data sharing, that really just complicates research that could be ongoing all the time that, that's for the public good. Now we'll switch gears a little bit and talk about kind of the second thing that we were trying to learn or hear from participants is about examples of uses and users that these folks felt were within social license or not within social license. So as Alison alluded to, we did get some consensus. So the participants did come to consensus on three, I would say users, examples of users of health data that they felt were within social license. So the first was healthcare practitioners to directly improve the healthcare decisions and services provided to a patient. The second, government's healthcare facilities or health systems administrators to understand and improve healthcare and the healthcare system. And the third, which I already mentioned earlier, um, is university based researchers to better understand the drivers of disease and well being. The participants also came to consensus on two examples that they felt were not within social license. Um, so you'll see up here, they felt it was not within social license for someone or some organization to sell or resell someone else's identifiable identified health data, and the second was health data being used for a purpose that has no patient, public, or societal benefit. And I think it's important to note that the participants in our process felt that these uses and users of health data were not socially acceptable or not within social license, uh, no matter the conditions were met or no matter what safeguards were in place. So during the process, the facilitators also presented statements that they felt could be within social license as long as there were specific conditions met and specific safeguards in place. But participants could not come to consensus on any of these examples. And we've provided a couple here on the slide. The first is about companies or private sector entities using health data. That's, I think, quite a common discussion that we've had a lot in the past couple of days as well. Um, so some felt that it is absolutely essential for companies to use health data from publicly funded services for the full range of, of, of data to full range of benefits to be realized, um, as long as there are certain conditions in place. So the data are not used for marketing purposes and individuals are not exploited, but others felt that companies or private organizations are just not trustworthy. And the risk of breaches of trust or privacy by companies is unacceptable because if harms are done, they cannot be undone. And many people felt that companies are primarily in the business to make profits they're not to serve the public. So there was some feeling about um, hesitation, strong hesitation about use by, by the private sector or companies. And the second is about the use of data about systematically marginalized populations. So some agreed that it could definitely be within social license for data about systematically marginalized populations to be used by researchers, um, as long as there were certain conditions in place. So indigenous data sovereignty is respected, the use does not discriminate against groups, and that these populations have control over how the data are collected, shared, and used. Um, but there was some skepticism and disagreement about how these conditions and these safeguards could truly be operationalized. So there was just, we did not come to consensus on this particular um, example. And this brings us to our conclusion. So what did we kind of find at the end? Um, Participants' contributions, we think, will offer kind of a new way of thinking about how and where to focus future initiatives related to expanding uses and users of health data. So what we learned really is that this boundary of, of social license is jagged, um, and it does vary depending on the individual and their perspective. So when we're thinking about increasing access to uses and users of health data, 
These are likely to be opposed by some groups, no matter what conditions are met or what requirements or safeguards are put in place. So what we recommended in the report is that instead of making broad changes to health data access policies, um, many public benefits could be realized by just focusing on these three uses of, or users of social license that we found in our process were within social license. So better patient care by healthcare practitioners, better health system planning, as well as a better understanding of disease and well-being by um, university-based researchers. And of course, as we mentioned, we, we also do hope that this work, that work will inform the work of the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy as it is developed and implemented. Talk a little bit about going forward and, and reflecting. Um, we did, after the process was, was finished, we did take some time to, to think about what worked well, what didn't work well, what could be improved. And one thing that helped us do this was to ask the participants and peer reviewers how they felt the process using the patient and public engagement evaluation tool. Um, there were generally positive responses and we did pull out some um, important themes from their responses that we wanted to highlight. Um, so the participants and peer reviewers felt that there were there was a diversity of perspectives and good exchange between participants. Uh, they also felt that the facilitators made a good effort to ensure that minority views were heard, not just views from the majority. Um, there were some suggested improvements to the process. Some people thought that it would be good to have French and English groups together. Um, and others thought that they'd like to have more meetings, including face-to-face -face meetings, which I completely understand. All these meetings were done on Zoom. There's a lot of Zoom fatigue for sure. Um, there's also, now this wasn't really an objective of the process, but there was an improved understanding of health data, social license and this concept. So we, we didn't set out to try to educate people on, on this topic, but people did feel at the end that they had a better understanding of the concept. And they also found the discussion quite enlightening because they heard perspectives that were unlike their own. The fourth one is kind of the one that we honed in on a bit in terms of how we could improve uh, next time or going forward. But there were some concerns about whether the findings would be used and how. So really around this idea of the impact of their time and contributions, um, would the report's findings be used by organizations who are engaging with the public about health data or used to influence policy changes? Uh, some just wanted to know more about how it would be used and the, the report's intended audience. Others were just not confident that, that it would be used or, or widely shared. Some strengths and limitations to, to the process. Um, we mentioned these before. So the inclusive design approach really allowed us to identify minority views that weren't as, as, as uh, apparent in previous work. Um, and this use of the five finger facilitation method allowed participants, allowed for consensus building, but still helped people be able to support statements while still expressing concern about certain things. Um, in terms of limitations, and this is quite common with any sort of public dialogue, I think, um, we know that in previous research, it tells us that this, I, this whole concept of data sharing, linkage, and use is quite complex and poorly understood. So we did invite individuals to participate in this process who already had a pretty good understanding of health data. Um, so this likely means that they probably have more knowledge about the benefits, risks, and opportunities associated with health data use than the general public. So it is possible that the examples that we found in this process that were within social license would be seen as outside of social license by other members of the public. Um, and it is also possible that we, that we did not identify other um, uses and users of health data that were within social license. So where are we going or what have we, what have we been doing with this and where are we going? Um, in terms of how we're kind of sharing these findings and moving forward, we already mentioned that we do hope that the findings will um, inform the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy. Um, and we have shared and will continue to share the findings and implications uh, of the work through various channels, including uh, channels that are more targeted to the general public. For example, we wrote a plain language article in The Conversation, which is a, a, an online publication that's uh, contributed to by researchers and academics, but it's targeted toward, towards the general public. Um, we're also currently working on a follow-up uh, manuscript uh, that we hope will be published in a peer-reviewed journal. And this, this manuscript will really focus on the process, which we outlined here today, as well as the evaluation piece. Um, and we thought that this is important to, to, do a, to do a piece like this, just because others then can replicate the, the work in their own area. Um, and in terms of future work, so again, as I mentioned, and I think Allison mentioned, we tried to ensure that the, the people we engaged with 
were as diverse as possible. But additional work needs to be undertaken to, to understand health data social license from uh, the perspective of peoples and groups that are different from mainstream society because of either their race, their gender, their, their other abilities. Um, something else we noticed interestingly was that there was some differences in views between the English and the French participant groups, but we didn't set out to look at that. So I, I think it would be interesting to do some more work to determine if, if these differences were more generalizable uh, or maybe associated with cultural or linguistic factors. Um, the process did lead to some unanswered questions as well. Uh, for example, what do we mean by the sale of health data? What do we mean by access to health data being timely? What do we mean by a legitimate use of health data? Or what does it mean when an individual who contributes health data is exploited? So there were a lot of these discussions throughout the, the dialogue sessions where we couldn't really come, we didn't have an answer, but they really generated some, some good perspectives. Um, and I will also acknowledge that, that um, out of all the participants, there was one participant included um, who was First Nations. And there were other non-Indigenous uh, people who emphasized the importance of Indigenous rights uh, in, this, in this health data social license, but the process did not focus specifically on the views of Indigenous people. So we, we recommend in the report as well that separate Indigenous-led work would uh, be required to identify the perspectives and concerns of, of these people. So that brings us to the end. And, and what I really want to say is that, again, to reiterate, this work should not be seen as, as the final answer on the topic of health data social license or the process to better understand it. Um, but it should be really be used as input to for future or ongoing public engagement um, initiatives that include members of the public with different perspectives, especially those that maybe don't have prior experience uh, related to health data and maybe those from historically uh, marginalized populations. So I think maybe what I'll do now is, um, could we, is Annabelle there? Ask Annabelle, who was a core team member, just to maybe provide a few minutes of her perspective on, on how the process went, and then maybe we can open it up to the audience. Um, and I will say also that, as Allison mentioned, there are a number of participants and peer reviewers of this process or the project that are here in the room uh, and also online, and we'd love to hear your perspectives as well. Well, thanks a lot, Julia. I won't take a lot of time because I'm really very curious to hear others uh, uh, discuss uh, the, this work. I, this, my, my stance was that I was, uh, I enjoyed the, the process thoroughly. I really enjoyed the inclusive design and it really uh, reinforced something that I knew, but um, there's nothing like living it up front is to the extent to which there are a diversity of opinions, even when you take individuals who have an understanding of data science. So that was something that uh, struck me in the whole process. And um, the, the image that Alison gave us about the uh, recognizing the, 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 this, the social license has a jagged line. It can change between time, people and it can change over time. So that's something I think that we really need to think of going forward. So going forward, one of the things I would love to hear from people in the audience or online is, is really how you uh, people feel that we can put this work to work. You know, that was one of the concerns of the participants is let's, let's not let this die out. Let's make us build on this. So what would the next text look like? How can we build on this? Do we, do we work on clarifying uh, different aspects with regards to the uses that are within social license, license or do we, and, do, and or do we continue defining requirements to attain social license for the other uses? So I'm looking really forward to the discussion. And thanks uh, to the whole team.